Welcome to Nutrition and COPD. My name is Anna Hamright and I am the Registered Dietitian for the Cardiac and Pulmonary Rehab Programs. So today our objectives of this presentation are just a quick overview of what nutrition and healthful nutrition is, how nutrition can affect our breathing, and then the effect that weight and breathing have on each other. So for an overview of nutrition, the importance of good nutrition is it helps our body fight infection, especially with people who are at risk, higher risk for chest infections that can pot potentially lead to hospitalization. Good nutrition is also important for maintaining healthy body weight. Overweight can make our heart and our lungs work harder and breathing more difficult. But then on the other side, if we're underweight, it can make us feel weak and tired. So what is good nutrition? It's just balanced nutrition. So think about balanced nutrition from the plate model you have in front of you. This is our food model. So it takes a plate and it divides it in half. So half our plate should be fruits and vegetables and then a quarter of it grains and a quarter of it protein and then we can have dairy on the side. We're trying to have all our food groups to make a balanced meal. So we'll go into each of these food groups. So first with grains, that was that upper quarter. So with grains, we want to try to have whole grains. Whole grains are things that are complete or so not refined. So think about brown rice instead of white rice, 100% whole wheat bread instead of white bread. Whole grains have higher fibers so they help keep us fuller longer and help regulate our digestive tract. Other sources of whole grains can be cereals, bread, crackers, rice, or pasta. So a serving of whole grain is typically one ounce. So this is a slice of bread or a cup of cereal or half a cup of rice. So overall, you'll have about six ounces of grains per day, roughly. So then we have our fruits and vegetables. So these were in the half of that plate model that we saw earlier. So we can't really go wrong with fruits and vegetables. We're trying to eat a variety of them. Fresh and frozen are usually preferred over canned, but canned can be fine too. Canned vegetables tend to be a little bit higher in salt, so try to get no salt out of virgin or rinsing, draining and rinsing them before consuming them. And then canned fruits can sometimes be higher in sugar. So you're trying to get canned in its own juices or canned in water. But when we're having fruits and vegetables, the number one thing is to have them. That's the most important thing. And then we're trying to eat a variety of them. So think about the colors. Usually the darker, richer colors have more nutrition in them than kind of the paler types of fruits and vegetables. Try to eat more dark green vegetables like broccoli or more orange vegetables like carrots. Those are both good options for you. Of course, our beans, our dried beans and peas and pinto beans and lentils all are technically vegetables too. These are again our great options for fiber sources, but also for protein sources. The goal for vegetables would be about two and a half cups per day. And with fruit, we have a variety of fruit you can choose from. We just want to make sure it's coming from the whole fruit instead of fruit juice. Ideally, then we're missing out on the fiber if we're just doing their juices. And you can see our fruit goal is a little less than our vegetable goal per day. With fruits and vegetables, it's kind of nice to eat seasonally when we eat fruits and vegetables that are in season. Usually they're on sale, but they also will be a higher nutritional value because it's when they're grown. So you can see the chart next to it that as we get into the spring and summer months and even the fall, we have a lot more options than maybe we do in the winter time for seasonal vegetables. And then our last two groups would be our dairy and our protein groups. So think about our meat and our beans would be our protein. So with dairy, we want to choose kind of lower fat dairy. 
if able. Sometimes we'll choose higher fat, depending on our goals in life. If you can't consume milk, you can always do lactose-free options. Calcium fortified foods or beverages would be good to incorporate as dairy tends to be our highest source of calcium in our diets. With meat and beans, we're trying to choose a lower fat or leaner meats and poultries, baking it or broiling it or grilling it instead of frying it. And again, we're trying to rotate have variable in the types of proteins that we choose. So more fish, beans, peas, nuts, and seeds are other great vegetarian sources of protein. But typically we have about five and a half ounces of protein per day. So three ounces would be a typical serving, which is the size of a deck of cards. So you're pretty close if you just have one on a big serving of protein per day. All right, so that was a real overview of what we're talking about with healthy nutrition and the importance of good nutrition. But now we'll go into specific goals for you all. So general goals would to be drink plenty of fluids, six to eight glasses of fluids per day, and limiting the caffeine. We want to include high fiber foods, so things like the whole grains of fruits and the vegetables, Fiber helps the GI tract. It can also control your blood glucose level and help reduce the cholesterol level in your blood. A good goal would be between 20 and 35 grams per day. And then we're trying to limit sodium. Sodium or excess sodium can cause food retention, which makes it harder to breathe. Then making sure you're getting enough calcium and vitamin D for your bones. Now let's go into hydration. The recommended amount of hydration is 64 to 86 ounces of fluid per day. Of course, with water being the best choice. Decaffeinated teas would be an excellent choice as well. Milk can be a choice and then decaf coffee also. We're trying to limit how much caffeine overall we're bringing in. And then with alcohol, it is a fluid, but you always want to ask your doctor for specific guidelines regarding alcohol. You might, they might tell you to avoid it or limit how much you're having. It does not have much nutritional value and sometimes can interact with different medications that we're taking, especially if you're having any oral steroids. And too much alcohol, alcohol may slow your breathing, making it difficult for you to cough, cough up mucus. So. Use your best judgment when you're consuming alcohol and don't count it as towards your total fluid for the day. And think about hydrating your body. So your lungs need to stay hydrated, your mucus needs to stay hydrated. And we get that from our fluids. Or we can have hydrating foods as well. Our fruits are really juicy, so that's hydrating or our soups, things such as that. And then fiber, fiber, fiber. And the more we increase our fiber in the diet, the more we want to make sure we're eating adequate, we're having adequate hydration as well. So we don't want fiber to do the opposite of it wants to. So fiber is great for our bodies. We want to eat a variety of grains, fruits, vegetables to get enough of the fiber that we need. So again, it can help reduce your overall blood cholesterol and there's your, your aim for 25 to 30 grams per day. And again, another kind of list of plant foods that contain fiber. Whole grains, fruits, vegetables, nuts, seeds, beans, and lentils are just some of the few. When you're thinking about choosing whole grains instead of refined grains, think of this as whole wheat pasta, whole wheat bread, brown rice instead of white rice. So this can be done by reading like the food labels is one way to kind of check to say hey is this a good way to get fiber in is this meal high in fiber this option so as you can tell on this food label it has seven grams of fiber in it typically if we have something that has four or more grams we would consider that a high serving or a high fiber food other ways you can incorporate more fiber into your diet would be adding beans to your entrees or just soups or on top of salads or having a side salad to go with your main entree 
things such as that. When we're choosing the whole grains, we want to look for a sticker. Well, one way we can tell if it's a whole grain is if it has this sticker on it that says whole grain. So that is a good indicator. It can get a little confusing because sometimes the food companies will put things on that say made with whole grains, 100% wheat. Those things don't actually mean anything towards the health of the food or the whole grain status of the food. We want it to say 100% whole wheat or 100% whole grain or have this sticker about the little stamp on it that says it is a whole grain. Some other sources of whole grain that I have not touched on yet are barley, buckwheat, farro, oatmeal, popcorn's a whole grain, quinoa, and then of course wild rice. So there's a bunch of different options out there that you can try to include into your diet. And then when you're looking at the whole grain stamp, the number one thing is that it's on there, that it is a whole grain. And then there's a couple of different levels if you wanted to get more in depth. There's a good source of whole grain, meaning half the servings of grains in that particular food are considered whole grain. Excellent source would mean it provides a whole serving of whole grains for your diet. And then 100% excellent means it provides a full serving of whole grains and then all grains that are used in the product are whole grains. So. Any of these are great to incorporate into your daily routine. And then the next tip we wanted to talk about was limiting sodium. We want sodium to be less than 2,000 milligrams per day. So to put that in more normal day speak, a quarter teaspoon of table salt has about 600 milligrams of sodium in it. So overall, in everything we eat, we want to have less than a teaspoon of salt. The typical American consumes about 3,600 to 4,000 milligrams a day, so almost double the recommendation. And as you can see from the pie chart, the majority of the sodium is coming from processed food and restaurant food. So that big blue piece of the pie is where we get the majority of our sodium in every day. The rest of it it can happen when it's naturally occurring in the food, added while eating, so like a salt shaker usage, or home cooking. But if we're trying to make a difference, we really want to try to limit those processed foods and restaurant foods. So the way you can do this is read the food label compared to the different sodium contents of the different foods you're buying. Try to buy frozen options or canned products without added salt or no added salt in them. Buy fresh poultry, seafood, and lean meats over the processed meats. Cooking more at home. Buying fewer jarred sauces or pre-made flavoring seasoning packets. And then using different citruses, herbs, spices to flavor your meals instead of salt. And just to, as we were talking about food claims earlier with the whole grains. This is a list of the different food claims that can be related to sodium. So the good ones would be sodium free, very low sodium, low sodium. Those are all good terms. They mean something. Reduced sodium or less sodium or light in sodium, lightly salted, don't mean as much. Reduced just means it's 25% less sodium than the regular product. So it doesn't necessarily mean it's low sodium, it just has less than the full sodium version. Same with light and lightly salted. Something just to be aware of. And of course, flavor, flavor, flavor. You still want to enjoy your food. So here is just a list of different seasonings to try out. Garlic powder is fine, thyme, paprika, cinnamon, nutmeg, chili powder, Italian herb, rosemary. And then if you kind of want to spice it up a little bit more, try ginger, turmeric, cumin. Those are all really strong flavors that can bring a lot to the meal so that you're not missing that salt flavor as much. And then lastly, we want to make sure that we're getting adequate amounts of calcium and vitamin D in our diet. So especially with COPD patients, you're at greater risk for osteoporosis. 
and vitamin D and calcium intake can reduce this risk. So our biggest sources of calcium and vitamin D in our diet are our dairy products. Other good sources of calcium would be our dark leafy greens or soy or our walnuts as you can see in the picture. We just don't have as much in them. Vitamin D we can also get from the sun just during this, not during November to March. So if we're not doing dairy consistently in our diet or have any of these other high calcium sources in our diet, supplementation may be needed. So you want to ask your doctor if maybe you should start taking a vitamin D supplement or making sure that you're getting enough calcium. All right, now moving on to nutrition and COPD tips. So why are we talking about nutrition? So nutrition, our eating food, the metabolism food takes oxygen and it produces energy and carbon dioxide. So as we're trying to eat our food and break it down, our cells need oxygen to make that process happen. So that can make it difficult to breathe and eat at the same time because the oxygen is getting pulled from two different areas. So that's some tips to try to help decrease that stress load would be to try to avoid overeating. If we eat too much, then we have too much to digest at one time. So then it makes it harder to breathe. So doing smaller meals, maybe more frequent meals, can relieve some of that burden. Other things we want to try to avoid gas producing foods. Uh, if we produce a lot of gas, then that can make breathing uncomfortable. These gas producing foods are carbonated beverages, fried greasy foods, heavily spiced foods can be, sometimes avocados. Beans are the big one, I think the most well known gas producing foods. And then any of our kind of cabbagey types of vegetables, the cruciferous family. So broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, cauliflower, corn. The leeks can do it. Cucumbers tend to be a problem for some people. And then of course also onions. So there's a variety. Maybe you can just learn which ones you digest better and which ones you don't. So while you're eating or before you're eating, try to clear your airway at least one hour before eating. This will just make it easier for that eating and breathing to happen at the same time. You wanna to try to eat more slowly. So take bites and chew your food slowly, breathing deeply while you're chewing and trying to put your utensils down between bites. This will also prevent the overeating from happening. And then maybe try to choose foods that are easy to chew, especially if you get winded pretty quickly or like energy. It's good to have easy to chew food so you're not having that burden of chewing and chewing and chewing without getting any of the nutritional value. So when we're trying to eat small frequent meals, this means five to six meals per day instead of the larger meals. So we talked about the oxygen that large meals can have, but then also if we eat a large meal, it can fill our stomach very full, which means our, our lungs have less room to expand inside of us. Another thing you can try to do to make sure you're getting enough nutrition is try drinking your liquids at the end of your meal. Drinking before or during the meal might make you feel more full or bloated than you actually are and make you stop eating and then you won't get in the nutrition you need every per day. And then another tip is to eat while sitting up to ease the pressure on your lungs. And then if you're having any trouble eating and breathing, try to use your purse left breathing between your bites to see if it helps you. So what if you're feeling like too tired to eat? And we just went through all the importance of keeping healthful nutrition. So if you're too tired to eat, these are some tips for you. Maybe try to choose foods that are easier to prepare. So saving your energy for eating. Otherwise, you might be too tired to eat after you made this huge meal. You could always ask your family 
our friend to help with some of the meal preparation to make it a little bit easier on you. Or check if you're eligible for any home delivered meal services like Meals on Wheels. Another tip you can do is like if you make a meal, maybe make extra since you're going through that whole work of cooking already. And then you can freeze the extra portions for times that you need a quick meal or you are too tired to cook or eat. Then you can try to rest before eating so you can actually enjoy your meal itself. And maybe try eating your main meal earlier in the day when you have more energy than if you waited till the end of the day when you're more drained. And then sweets, cookies, cakes, and pies, these simple carbohydrates as we refer to them, can cause you to hold on to too much carbon dioxide at the time. And that can also cause some tiredness. So if you're noticing you're getting really tired after dessert, maybe try not to have the dessert and see if that tiredness has. So what if you're having shortness of breath? Some of the things that we can do to help decrease the amount of shortness of breath you're having during your meals is to try to rest 30 minutes before you eat. If you come, become short of breath during your meal, try your purse lift breathing. You want to sit upright and lean forward with your elbows on the table, placing your feet on the ground. This will give you the greatest expansion for your lungs to do your, their breathing. And if you are on continuous oxygen, ask your healthcare provider if you should increase the flow rate during your meals. Do not adjust your oxygen flow without talking to your healthcare provider. And of course, then you want to relax before and after meals. Anxiety can also cause shortness of breath. So if you're anxious or stressed about something else and then go into eating, it can have that residual side effects. And what if you're experiencing bloating? So these are some tips for reducing bloating. Try not to rush with your meals. Again, eat slow. Try not to eat when you're short of breath. So if you're short of breath and you're trying to eat, this can cause you to swallow air and will make the bloating worse. Of course, maybe you're always a little bit short of breath, so you need to judge this one for yourself. Drink fluids one hour before your meal and one hour after. So that's again not eating and drinking at the same time because Drinking and eating will cause your stomach to be fuller and more uncomfortable and maybe just feeling that bloating. Again, try to avoid the foods that cause gas-producing foods. Onions, cabbage, sauerkraut, broccoli, Brussels sprouts. Beer can be one as well, that carbonation. If you are noticing bloating, maybe try to reduce your fried and fatty foods. High fat foods reduce how fast you digest foods. So if the, you're not digesting foods at a normal speed, then that means it's kind of sitting in your stomach a little bit longer than it should and give you that feeling of bloating. That's something just sitting there. Also know that lactose can cause bloating. Lactose is a sugar that is found in milk, yogurt, cottage cheese, and other dairy products. So if you're noticing bloating after dairy products, maybe try some lactose-free options. So that would be like the lactate milk or maybe do an almond milk instead. Also try to avoid being constipated. If we're constipated and then we're trying to put more food into us but none is coming out, it can create that feeling of bloated. So we can reduce constipation by adding in more fiber, but also adding in the fluid at the same time. It can help decrease that symptom. And maybe you're struggling with your appetite and just don't have a very big appetite. Things that you can do is maybe talk to your doctor. Sometimes your poor appetite is due to depression and that can be treated. You can avoid doing any non-nutritive beverages such as black coffee and tea. So sometimes if you just keep drinking coffee and coffee and tea and tea throughout the day, it makes you feel full because there's liquid in your stomach, which means your appetite never gets triggered. You may want, also want to try to eat 
more protein and fat, and then less simple sugars. So this is kind of thinking about more bang for your buck at your meals. So the protein and the fat have higher calories and more nutrition in them per bite than the simple sugars. And again, like simple sugars or sugary type of foods can cause that increased tiredness. You can again try to do small frequent meals See so just a little bit throughout the day, multiple times throughout the day, to help bring that appetite back. Maybe try to walk or participate in a light activity to help stimulate your appetite. And then of course, try to keep food visible and within reach so that if your appetite does come back, you're ready for it. And maybe the seeing the food will help trigger that appetite. So, what if you're underweight and you need to gain weight? So if you have CD, COPD, being underweight can be a serious problem. A person with COPD needs an extra 430 to 720 calories a day, depending on your size. And that's just to do the work of breathing, because breathing gets so tiresome. So if you're needing to gain weight, you can always ask your doctor or your dietitian about nutritional supplements. Of course, if you, so these are drinks, like think about Intro Booster common brands, but you do not want to use these supplements and replace the meals. They're supposed to supplement the meals, not replace the meals. You want to try to avoid the lower fat or lower calorie products. So as I said earlier, for a general healthful diet, we're trying to do lower fat dairy. But maybe we need a, you to gain weight and you're not eating a lot at this time. So you could probably do a higher fat dairy in that case to just help with that weight gain. You can use calorie boosters to add to your favorite foods. So think about adding dried milk powder or maybe a little bit of olive oil or an extra egg yolk or something like that to boost the calories without making the meal bigger or having a larger quantity that you have to consume. Think about more high calorie snacks, so cheese, peanut butter is a great option if you can tolerate it because it's calorie dense. And of course, you during all of this, you want to continue to eat a variety of food from the, all the different food groups. If we're really focused on we're trying to gain weight and then we're just eating bread on bread on bread on bread, we're not having a balanced diet, so we won't have the best effects for the weight gain. Oh, and then here are some other high calorie foods. So you wanna be a little bit on the cautious side when you're having the sugar type foods like the ice cream and the cookies and the pudding, but they can be incorporated in moderation. Our cheese, granola bars, sandwiches, eggs, crackers with peanut butter, bagel with peanut butter and cream cheese gonna be another high calorie snack. Fruit or vegetables with dips, so like with hummus or bean dips or yogurt dips, yogurt with granola, maybe having some popcorn with some oil and Parmesan cheese on it, or anything like with a cheese sauce. So those are just some high calorie foods. So the idea behind that is more bang for your buck. So more calories in a smaller package for your weight gain to occur. And then here are some references for you where we got a lot of this information but maybe if you needed some additional resources these would be two good ones to use so if you have any questions about that brief overview of nutrition and copt please let me know and thank you for watching